So we're supposed to go someplace over there to look for an interesting farm, but I had to stop and appreciate, as I always do, uh, some of the volcanic geology along this riverbank here. Do not see much of this in, in uh, New England. In fact, the only time I've seen basalt uh, this perforated uh, has been up in the Aussie Valley of New Hampshire. Of course, that's a completely separate uh, volcanic event. That's part of the you know White Mountain Igneous Province. This year is because the vast majority of this part of uh, New England was at one point a rift valley that had opened up, um, you know, a failed fissure to create a new ocean. And as a result of that, you had like a you know, flood basalt is what that's called. So real interesting. We're going to see. We've got some watercraft. They get kayaks down over here, over there. So I'm guessing it's fairly safe to cross. The wind's going to be blowing us in the opposite direction. The river's flowing. So we'll see what happens. But it's supposed to be some real interesting fern ferns over there across on those cliffs. We'll check in in a moment. There you go, there's some basalt. So we paddled our way out across the uh, the mighty Connecticut, just surveying these wonderful uh, cliff faces of Arcos conglomerate, looking for a cool cryptogram of fern. Uh, we may have found a little specimen of it, but we're gonna keep looking to see if we can find the, the mother load, so to speak, because it, it may be lurking here. Uh, Arcos, if you don't know, this is basically just uh, rocks cemented together in sandstone. Uh, on the other side of the river was all that volcanic stuff. So this river kind of divides two different formations. No clue if this could possibly be part of the New Haven Arcos formation, but uh, certainly do get a lot of it in uh, this region of uh, New England. Anyway, we're going to keep putzing around here. It's a beautiful day to be out on the water. Surprisingly warm for October, but you know, I I'm used to warm Octobers now. The water is uh, clear and delightful. And uh, yeah, we'll tool around here for a little while and see what there is to see. You got some nice, uh, one of the fragile ferns, Cystopterus bulbifera. Bulblet fern's a common name. We couldn't find any bulblets on it. Also got a nice, lovely Selaginella. And I'm an idiot, so what, what was it called again? Selaginella apoda. Selaginella apoda. One of the, uh, like, relative of lycopod, different family though. So this is, would be Selaginaceae. So this is the same genus, same general uh, life form of a lot of the resurrection ferns out west. But out here in the east, they tend to take on more of this damp loving uh, habitat that you see here. Got a lovely liverwort growing next to it. Evidence of the uh, relative humidity of um, the cliff face here. We're still trucking along. We've been here all day. This has been real nice actually. Still. You can't climb up there even if you wanted to. We're just confined to the strip along the river. No luck finding the originally the original farm we were looking for, but that's okay. It's been a very interesting time. Here's a cool, uh, not in bloom obviously, because it's a pacara. Uh, real interesting pacara. Oh, you got a leaf hopper there too. Hey, little guy. Um, not one I've seen before. I'll have to find pictures of it in flower to show you, but these have been everywhere. So this cliff face probably looks real freaking nice earlier in the season when these are still blooming. But we're going to go check out a power line easement. It's a little bit further up river and then see how many more spots we can get to today. But you got Rubus odoratus growing out of the cliff face here too. Lots of interesting stuff. Not what we were looking for, but that's okay. Just because you don't find what you're looking for, you might find something. And sometimes finding a surprise is better than finding a target, at least in my opinion. But we're going to trudge on here. Here, um... Okay, so that's so this is the non-hybrid. So we found uh, one of the targets for today. This is allegedly, well, probably not allegedly. No, no one's photographed this this plant. This is a hybrid. It's a lycopodium hybrid. So on the right there, my friend Alex has one of the non-hybrids. And would you mind just explaining yeah. to the folks what the difference is between the two and why this is so interesting? So we have two species: um, lycopodium clavitellum and lycopodium lagopus. Um, lagopus will have this one. Uh, and this branching. is like opus right here in your hand? Yes. This is the rare one, and this one will just be single branch with like one mm -hmm. um, inflorescence. Um, and then what will happen is that clavitellum will have many, many little branches, except they branch off directly from here. Yeah. And they'll have like more than three typically. Okay. But if you look here, these ones have more than one inflorescence, mm -hmm. and they're branching off it. They look which, really weird. <laughs> which is not typical. They, they almost look mutated. There's a nice uh, pyrola yeah. back here too. Some, sometimes a logopus will have one of these, but it won't be this frequent. Yeah, um, and this is doing both. It's splitting It's splitting in the middle of like the strobili too. And if you look here, the foliage is uh, rather oppressed compared to clavitellum. 
Do you have the foliage of clavit? Oh no, you have like opus in your hand. Okay. Um, th th there's the like. But like, like, does like opus have that similarly oppressed uh, it does. foliage? It does. Clavitellum is more spread out. Oh, that's so cool. And for the unindoctrinated, lycopods. So these aren't ferns. These aren't flowering plants. These are a secret third thing. So lycopods, they are spore-bearing plants like ferns, and they're uh, tracheophytes. So they do have that internal plumbing, uh, but they're doing a little bit. They do their spore uh, anatomy a bit differently than. Um, than uh, your fern. Basically, all you need to know is that these branched off a little bit before ferns. This, these, or at least their ancestors, once formed giant forests, uh, you know, in the Carboniferous. That's what a lot of coal seams are made out of. Um, yada, yada, yada. Actually, there is an orchid next to you, Alex. This is yeah. Byranthes, right there. Ah. I got it in my video. Nice, I'll take a picture of that too. No clue what species, way too late in the season, but uh, we uh, had a heck of a time getting up here. But uh, that's real interesting and goes to show you, um, not enough people are studying this stuff where you just have a goober like me being shown something really cool uh, by another passionate, I hate the word citizen scientist, but that's what I mean. Just, you know, you gotta come out and look for the stuff because you'd be surprised, not many people are. And now we've got it documented, we've got it photographed. And I mean, there's not a, what, not a single research paper about this. It's a footnote in the flora uh, yep. of this county. Uh, collected 2019. That's crazy. All right, I'm gonna take a few pictures and we gotta hightail it. So we've come, across, come up on this uh, somewhat sketchy escarpment. They got a nice, uh, nice tower, as you'll find across many locations in New England, exemplifying the fact this is probably the highest thing for a little bit ways around. Anyway, we get an interesting Selaginella here, Selaginella rupestris, kind of one of the main goals of today. Unlike the other one, which was growing kind of in the wet, soggy stuff, this thing is growing out open, exposed, and uh, seems to not really uh, be worse for wear. Again, lycopods, kind of the theme of today. Oh, this isn't a lycopodia, this is a Selaginaceae, but a, a relative of lycopods. It's in that same clay, the, the lycophytes. So, anyway. This guy seems to be doing just fine, kind of as a moss does, uh, or similar to a moss, can tolerate, uh, can tolerate the, the open, can tolerate probably drying out pretty substantially. Got a nice little potentia next to it, probably one of the common or invasive, common or non-native ones. But uh, that's real interesting, just coming right out of this rock face, uh, sheer and exposed. So we'll uh, continue on our adventure for today. But that's a fascinating one. So common theme for today. Here's another one that's never been on my radar. This is a cool member of the rose family. This is a species of Crataegus. Crataegus stonii, according to my friend Alex, but you won't find it on INAT. Allegedly endemic to New England, New York, and Pennsylvania. It's not exactly common, but you get a whole bunch of Crataegus. A lot of them are lumped together, and a lot of them are not well studied. Hawthorne's the common name, which comes from those nasty little spikes, which I believe, unless I'm completely mistaken, are actually the petioles from last year's leaves falling off or from branching. Those are not the same as a rose spines, which would arise from the epidermis that is in fact, you know, wood making those up. So Crataegus is a huge, huge, huge uh, genus of, you know, small tree, a lot of overlap. Some of them are quite rare. You can see down through there, there's one, and many of them employ some rather interesting leaf shape, but you can't always go off of leaves for um, for you know diagnostics, just because uh, you know you gotta go off the flowers. Any case, that's a neat one, one I've never seen before. But I'm not really super into the Crataegus, so we'll take our pictures and we'll hope that you know we can get the um, the actual ID situation straightened out there. I tell you, everything about today has been rather sketchy. So coming to you from yet another sketchy rock face, we got a real cool fern here. This is uh, Palea atropoperia, the purple stemmed rock break and I am a taxonomy nerd I am 90% sure this is one of the chylanthoid ferns so chylanthoidae is uh is it pteridaceae I'll have to look up after but anyway this subfamily of whatever family this is in um is basically the subfamily that encompass that holds all of the desert ferns in it chylanthoidae all right remember that because they're real interesting and a lot of them are real specialists in just these arid rocky habitats out east and out west you can find them growing in the desert of all places so let me zoom in here for you so there's that stem kind of black at this point in the year would be purple 
a little bit earlier in the year. And check out these freaking sorry on the other side. How cool is that? Just aligning the inside almost has a partial indusium there. Makes me wonder if it actually does have one when it's a little bit warmer out earlier on in the year. So this is a rock loving specialist known from again this part of the this part of uh you know the, the region, this the Connecticut River Valley broadly, but up and down it, which you know that's a pretty extensive thing. Other cliff, cliff dweller right there, Aquilegia canadensis. In fact, I'm looking out now. There's another one of those Pileas there. Pilea atropurpurea. Pretty sure it's a chylanthoid. I could be mistaken, but I don't think I am. It the habitat suits it here. So without falling off the side of this cliff, probably gonna be some of my sloppiest camera work ever. But I can't. I can't even get the tripod here, even if I had it on me. Saw a doggo by color hanging on there. And over here, off the similarly sketchy cliff face, we've got a real interesting relative of a plant I've covered extensively. Some people might know this as being in the genus Minuartia. Uh, Sabina is another genus, or Sabulina is the other genus. But either way, I'm just going to go with uh, I'm just going to go with Minuartia. This is one of those nice caryophyllaceous. Uh, plants relative Minuartia grow in Landica, which is an alpine plant. This is allegedly by far the most common Minuartia or Sabulina species in New England. Uh, oh god, I forget the common name, but you want to know what? Who cares? It's Sabulina Mitshoxii or Minuartia Mitshoxii. There's the seed pods up there, long past flower. Caryophyllaceae is the uh, family. Again, Minuartia historically has been the genus, which is mostly you know, alpine bald loving plants as you can see the thing is one of the little pincushion plants little pincushion plant you know uh, loving it here right to the side of the cliff you got some uh, Ionactus linaria folia there too another, another uh, barren lover so that's interesting I've only ever actually seen mini arctic girl land to come which is theoretically more rare this one just needs like you know it's a bald lover Loves the balds. It's fall in New England, mofos. You get used to it. We're gonna be doing a lot more stuff like this where I don't think any of you are interested in this because it's not showy stuff, but it's very, very interesting, trust me. You 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 spend you know you spend a few years botanizing your backyard, you get all the really showy stuff down, you start looking for this stuff because no one else is, and uh, people need to be studying it. So we're gonna see maybe hit one or two other spots, but this has been a really interesting day for me really challenging had to open my mind up a little bit look at some plants some from some lineages I didn't necessarily care about and uh, get on these really sketchy escarpments but it is what it is okay so you guys are gonna have to bear with me here I'm in a hole and what you're looking at there whether you believe me or not is actually a species of fern this is the theme of today's episode weird cryptic shit that most people probably aren't going to care about. This is Christopterus or uh, oh god now I forget the other epithet for it but or the other genus name but this is a filmy fern the family Hymenophyllaceae. So this is the only one we get in New England. I guess there's a few sprinkled around Appalachia and down south. These are uh, more common you know temperate rainforest. In New Zealand you get a whole bunch of these. These are basically famous for having leaves that are essentially one cell thick requiring near constant moisture. And this thing's in a hole, no competition, barely competing with what appears to be maybe some lichen or some sort of mildew. But this, this plant's fascinating because it will never actually, oh geez, I'm gonna lose my phone. It'll never actually go to its sporophyte stage. You gotta remember, ferns have two stages in life. They have a gametophyte, which you rarely see, which is what this is. And then you have your sporophyte, which is what you typically think of when you think of a fern, that's the actual vegetative fern. So this is Trichoman oh Trichomanes, that's the other genus name. So Trichomanes intricatum, Hymenophyllaceae, super weird, weft fern, bristle fern, gets a few common names, and this thing will just stay a gametophyte its entire life. It will not produce an actual leaf-bearing body, it will not produce spores, it's going to stay in this state, reproducing via archegonium and antheridium, meaning sperm and egg. It's just, it just, it just lost that stage of its life. How does this thing even freaking photosynthesize? It's such a weird fucking fern. Um, probably more common than we think it is. 
but it's just so cryptic. And I mean, are you going to crawl in a calcareous hole and go looking for it yourself? I'm not sure if you are, my friend. Uh, I'll be in here in my chasm, in my filmy fern chasm. And uh, it's such a weird plant. Oh, I hope people actually appreciate this one. Anyway, it's nighttime now. We're going to see what else we can see. We'll get some more stuff coming. But this is going to be either a, a weird episode no one's going to like or going to be a crowd favorite episode. We'll see what happens. Anyway, Trichomanes intricatum, Hymenophilaceae, real weird fern family, real weird life cycle that this particular one has. And no, that is not a moss, my friend. That is that is a fern gametophyte. That's an aspect of fern life you've probably never seen before. And this guy, whew, mosquito on my face, this guy stays in that form his entire life cycle. What a fucking weirdo.